Yo. With the release of Crash Bandicoot Warped on the PlayStation 1 in 1998, the classic 3D platformer trilogy had come to a close. And it wouldn't be until the holiday season of 2001 that another 3D platformer in this franchise would release. But a lot of things happened between that window of time, including two completely different games and two completely different genres being released for this franchise. Those two games being Crash Team Racing, a kart racing game that is quite similar to Mario Kart, but is actually a hell of a lot better in many ways, and Crash Bash, a party game that I guess is kind of in the same category as Mario Party, but in concept only as a mini game collection. And not a particularly good one either. Now, logic would dictate that for this retrospective, we would cover those two games next. But I'm actually going to save those for later when we talk about all the racing games and spin-offs together. Instead, I want to jump to the next mainline title, the next 3D platformer crash game, the true successor of Crash Warped. To better contrast these games, that are often compared to one another, for better or for worse. The one important piece of info though, moving into this next entry, is that after Crash Warped was finished by Naughty Dog, the team would then create Crash Team Racing as their last entry in the franchise, released in 1999. And it was actually being created alongside Crash Warped at the time. After Crash Team Racing's release though, Naughty Dog would begin development on Jack and Daxter The Precursor Legacy for the PlayStation 2 the first installment in what would become their next epic trilogy. Embark on an epic journey in a mystical world unlike our own. A world in search of new heroes. Heroes that stand fast in the face of evil. I was right behind you, Jack! Really? I was. A new legacy is born. For everyone. Bring him on! Naughty Dog was soon acquired by Sony Computer Entertainment as well, and I mean, they were kind of creative and game dev geniuses after all, and helped in defining the PlayStation's place in the video game market, so it was probably a no-brainer for Sony at the time. However, the catch was Universal Interactive retained control of the Crash Bandicoot intellectual property. As Naughty Dog's deal with Universal expired, Universal President Mark Cerny departed the studio and formed the independent consultancy Cerny Games to continue his relationship with Naughty Dog and Sony. That is to say, every one of the men and women who handcrafted these phenomenal titles had left for greener pastures. But this left Crash Bandicoot as a series in a dark place where there is money to be made and fans hungry for more, but it's no longer in the hands of those who brought it up to the heights it's gotten to in the first place. This is often a very bad place for a video game series, but there's always hope that whoever takes the helm next can either continue that same magic or take the series to bold new places that further add to it. But like I said, the first new game after Naughty Dog's departure was Crash Bash, developed by Eurocom, and well, that's a story for a later time, but it wasn't exactly the best. However, with the next console generation on the horizon, PlayStation 2, Nintendo GameCube, and even a newcomer to the bunch, the Microsoft Xbox, it was now time for Crash as a franchise to be tested. Stepping outside the realm, the domain, the kingdom of the PS1, and Naughty Dog's oh-so-naughty, but loving hands, and into the traveling hands of Traveler's Tales. The world, come October 29th, 2001, was going to see what a new Crash game, made by new devs to the franchise, released on new consoles for potentially new audiences, looks like. And the name of this game, this successor to 3D platformer royalty, was named Crash Bandicoot, The Wrath of Cortex.
Does this hurt? Oh! Does this hurt? Oh! Does that tickle? Ah! You know what's funny? This is my chart. Sometimes it's story time. Hey, what's for dinner around here? Share with your roommate, right? I need pepper. <laughs> more pain, more game. Crash is back in his toughest adventure yet, The Wrath of Cortex. It's going to be just like the good old days, only better. Rated E for everyone. <laughs> you know my insurance covers sponge baths. So, before we go into the main game proper, I feel some context about the development of this game is important as it's actually fairly well documented. The Wrath of Cortex was originally intended to be designed by Mark Cerny, who had designed all the games in the series thus far and published by Sony Computer Entertainment. The game under Cerny's direction was to be a free-roaming title with puzzle elements that would see Crash traveling between different planets. In early 2000, when Universal approached Traveler's Tales to be the development team behind the game, they produced a 3D rendered demo of Crash running through a volcanic level, which you can see here. The development of the game's engine began in mid-2000 and was originally entitled Crash Bandicoot Worlds. Now from this point on I'd like to introduce YouTuber GameHut. GameHut is a channel run by John Burton, who was director of Traveler's Tales slash Traveler's Tales games for 29 years, and helped in making games like Sonic 3D Blast, Mickey Mania, and most importantly, Crash the Wrath of Cortex. This channel is all about showing behind the scenes development stuff from the skill and coding tricks Traveler's Tales developers and employees use to make these games, to early betas, early build differences, and in Crash Wrath of Cortex's case, more than just a beta, but an entire pitch and game design document for what the next generation Crash Bandicoot game was going to look like. As noted earlier, the game that was originally pitched was titled Crash Bandicoot Worlds, and for the time had very lofty and ambitious goals and ideas of how to take the franchise to the next level, which John reads through here in the opening of that original pitch given to Universal Interactive for their approval. Crash Bandicoot Worlds, concept doc. Right, the mission statement. The aim of Crash Bandicoot Worlds is to successfully transfer Crash from the PSX to the PS2. It needs to encapsulate all that Crash represents in terms of easy to understand objectives and gameplay, combined with stunning graphics. To be a success, Crash Bandicoot Worlds has to stay true to the original series while taking full advantage of the power of the PS2. It will achieve this in the following ways. The gameplay will be classic Crash. We may add slightly more momentum to Crash and some extra moves. We may make the camera move a little more freely. We will add extra crate types and may introduce the ability to move crates around. We'll add the ability to take branching paths and wide open areas for Crash to explore. The graphics will be state of the art for the PS2. We will take advantage of the linear nature of Crash gameplay to deliver cutting edge graphics and effects. We'll produce animation and effects software to cater for this. 
The game will incorporate dynamic systems to allow for realistic movement of in-game objects. Crates, for example, will explode and the shrapnel will collide with the ground, crash or other characters in a realistic way. The game will also incorporate morphing and particle systems. This will allow for interesting enemies and boss characters using Terminator 2 and Abyss style effects. As well as the above, we will include volumetric lighting and shadowing, fogging and all the usual high-end effects we expected from a next-generation game. The game will be a showcase for the PS2 and will prove that Crash gameplay is as addictive as ever. Game genre. Linear platform as previous Crash games, but with branching and some open areas and flying or racing based sub-games. Graphics. Real-time 3D environments and characters. Art direction. As previous Crash games, but with higher resolution and slightly edgier. The perspective. Third person. The level layout. Linear in-game selectable from a level select screen. The platform. PS2. Number of players. Single player. Market. 7 to 16 year old boys and girls. Core gamers. Release, Q3 or 4, 2001. Competitive products, Spyro 2, Rayman 2, Tarzan. Now much of this, besides, say, the more open areas for Crash to explore, matches at least some aspects of the game we ended up getting. Where this design document differs vastly is in the story department. Okay, the story. Neocortex has turned the peaceful solar system of Tibbon Coda into his own laboratory experiment. Each of the five once beautiful and serene planets in the system has been converted into a virtual chemistry set. He has subjected one planet to extreme heat, another to extreme cold, blocked out all sunlight from one, flooded one with water. Then he has tried to create new species to survive in the extreme conditions. He has been employed by the ultimate evil, Elemental. Her aim, to create the perfect battle drone suitable to aid her conquest of the galaxy. Each of the planets has a neocortex controlled research center which keeps the planet in its extreme condition. Each research center is protected by a neocortex experimental life form. This is a boss. Crash has to find the passkeys to the research lab from each level. Once he has all four keys, he can access the research center. He can then destroy the research base to return each planet to its natural state. He then has to defeat the world boss before he can get to the next planet. He then has to destroy Neocortex's orbital space station and defeat Neocortex and Elemental. There is a hidden bonus item on each world. Crash needs to find all five of them. Crash will receive the bonus item if he rescues all the indigenous inhabitants that he sees in the world. There may only be inhabitants on one level in each world. Now, I will get into the actual story of Crash the Wrath of Cortex in a moment, but needless to say, besides the four elements thing, is very different from the story we ended up getting. Of note is the new main baddie, Elemental, who never ended up in the final release of the game. It seems that they were very interested in a new female character or characters in general for this game, as the design document also throws out three different new female character ideas including a possible new main love interest for Crash who would at first appear as a mysterious masked figure, another being an evil twin for Coco named Quoco who was raised in secret by Neocortex and is mind controlled under his command and is not aware she is related to Crash and Coco, but by the end of the game, Crash would rescue her from Cortex's glutches. Remember this one because this is actually the closest to the final new character that was introduced to Crash Wrath of Cortex, but gender swapped. And finally, a rather interesting and oddly dark one, Rio, the daughter of Cortex, which I think I'll let John explain what she was meant to be here. Neo Cortex's daughter Rio appears in cutscenes and in game. She is basically good and tries to help Crash when she can. Neo Cortex and Rio converse in a similar way to Dr. Evil and his son, Scott. Neo Cortex is bent on destroying Crash, and Rio kind of likes Crash. Possible love interest. Neo may accidentally kill her at the end of the game while trying to kill Crash. Crash can save her if he is quick during end battle. Two endings, one sad, one happy. That is rather interesting and similar as the video suggests to a character that would appear in a different installment of the franchise. But we mustn't get ahead of ourselves. The document also lists Crash's moveset, which is near identical to Crash's moveset in Warped. It also notes the primary ideas for each of the four planets Crash would be jumping and spinning his way through to save, all of which would have been plunged into despair thanks to Cortex's meddling, such as a planet that has all the sun's lights reflected on it, or a planet that is completely flooded, etc. Each planet would have four main levels, which you could choose from in any order, plus a final level, which would be the research lab and primary base 
of Cortex's minions on each planet, which you would then destroy and fight a boss in, and then you could move on to the next planet. This is very interesting because it retains the freedom and level of choice seen from Crash 2 and 3 with their pick any five levels you want sort of structure, while also saving aside a special level for the end of each world. Thus, each planet would sort of be like a mini version of Crash's journey to stop Cortex and save the inhabitants, like in Crash 1, which I think is a genuinely super clever idea from both a gameplay and narrative standpoint. I really, really wish that this ended up making it into the final game. However, as cool as all this is, obviously this isn't the game we ended up getting. On September 21st of 2000, Universal Interactive Studios and Konami announced that they had entered an agreement that would enable Konami to publish a Crash Bandicoot game for next generation game systems, with Universal Interactive handling the production of the games. The agreement served to break the Crash Bandicoot's franchise's exclusivity to Sony produced consoles, and effectively made Crash Bandicoot a mascot character for Universal rather than Sony. This would officially make Crash a multi-platform franchise from here on out. Not terrible news necessarily, though it does split the attention a fair bit for the developers. But then eventually Sony and Cerny had a falling out with Universal. I'm going to make an educated guess that the falling out had something to do with the game going multi-platform instead of being a PS2 exclusive. But it also could have been that mixed with creative differences, shall we say. Though again, as far as I'm aware, this isn't exactly clear what exactly happened to make Sony and Cerny back out from this whole thing? But I think my educated guess is uh, pretty well educated. But either way, Traveler's Tales was forced to alter the game from a free roaming title that Cerny envisioned to a standard Crash Bandicoot title. Traveler's Tales had to begin development from the game from scratch from then on, and were given only 12 months to complete the game that we would end up getting. The developers had to rush to finish this game, its scope tailored back considerably. But with all that being said, how did it end up? What was the final product of that 12 month development cycle? Well, let's take a look, shall we? Starting with the story. Am I? Ho oh, ho, that's right. Retrospective. <clears throat> so, the story of Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex starts off in the space station, where Cortex and Jin Tiny Tiger, Dingle Dial, and Dr. Entropy are all having their asses chewed out by Uka Uka because we failed to defeat Crash Bandicoot and... Wait, weren't me and Entropy like babies in the last game's ending? Did we grow back up or...? <laughs> you know, I don't even want to know. Anyway, according to some chart, which is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard, we haven't been spreading enough evil around. Now, I would actually argue that I have been spreading plenty of evil around. Even if Crash does end up stopping me each time. I mean, think about it this way. Did Hitler or Stalin not spread evil just because they were eventually stopped or died? <laughs> it makes a little more sense when you think about it, doesn't it? <laughs> now, now, I would have uh, argued this point with Fukuoka if I wasn't strung out on uh, antidepressants and uh, meh. Ooh. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I mean math of the crystal variety. Oh, you can really see it in my eyes. I was in a dark place, you know. <laughs> I was even considering killing Engine just to feel something again. <coughs> but I digress. Uka Uka wants us to come up with one good plan to destroy that bandicoot once and for all. 
Now, an evil genius such as myself always has a scheme or two in his back pocket. You know, for a rainy day or something. Unfortunately, Entropy and Engine ratted me out like the little double-headed shit snakes that they are. You see, ever since I was defeated previously, I've been working on a brand new super weapon that will most definitely, possibly, absolutely... <laughs> Defeat that bandicoot. Of course, again, I need a power source, which is awful convenient. I've always needed a power source. Every single machine that I fucking make needs some sort of power source. And of course, I have to obtain them and then they'll... It's, you know, you know, it's just, it's just tiring. I'm sorry. It's just... It's like my life is a video game and someone's like setting me up to always fail. Ugh, anyways... Conveniently, right on cue, Aku Aku remembers a new power source that we can use to power my super weapon, the Elementals. A group of masks that, well, they have elemental powers, it's in the fucking name. Also, one minute, going off script for a second, I'm going to read their names. Rocco, Wawa, Pyro, and Lolo. I have to say, the writers were not paid for this shit. This story is completely stupid. I mean, the evil chart? Really? There's a chart that just tracks the amount of evil we've done? And these names are completely stupid! Oh, what? Whatever. We're getting back on script. Anyways, with their powers combined, my super weapon, maybe, possibly, absolutely? Question mark? could actually destroy Crash Bandicoot, take over the world, <laughs> and maybe kill Engine anyway. <laughs> and maybe all these failures would have been for something. Get ready to face my wrath, Crash Bandicoot! <laughs> Unfortunately though, over on Schizo Island, Crash and his stupid little friends notice the natural disasters happening, and Aku Aku realizes that we are up to no good once again. So, <laughs> you know the drill. Mass Jesus and Satan have a discussion, and then the four beasts of Revelation, or the four elements, show up and are all like, no one can stop us! And then Aku Aku goes to get Crash and Coco and stop us. And Coco has like this <laughs> convenient little portal chamber thing to get to the wharf room and <laughs> whatever. The important thing is I get to introduce the little beta cut Crash to the alpha male Crunch. A bandicoot souped up on steroids, five dozen eggs and four elemental mass of mass destruction. He is everything Crash was supposed to be, but better, of course. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe things are finally turning up Cortex. I mean, it is a new console generation. What could possibly go wrong? Am I right? So, yeah, Crash the Rafa Cortex has an interesting premise from the get-go. Obviously, we can see all the ways the game's scope was drawn back or things were altered. Instead of Crash traveling across planets, he's traveling across a warp room not unlike Crash Warped. Instead of a brand new Big Bad Elemental, we have Uka Uka again. Not that I'm necessarily complaining, mind you but also in addition of the four masks based around earth, water, fire, and wind. There isn't a new sister for Crash, but instead a kind of, but not really, but I guess kind of brother in Crunch. Crunch conceptually is actually the most interesting new addition to the cast, for this game in my opinion. After all, back in the first game, Cortex surmised that a bandicoot would be the perfect general for his mutant army to take over the world. And while obviously Crash ended up being a failure in that regard, Cortex was actually completely on the money there. After all, Crash Bandicoot has almost single-handedly thwarted him 
and all his minions, and Uka Uka three times now, alongside the help of his Bandicoot sister in Aku Aku, of course. If Cortex had accomplished his goals and bring Rosh and Crash, he would have no doubt had the most powerful weapon in his hands. But sadly for him, he had accidentally created his greatest, most powerful adversary. Again, tying back to those Dr. Frankenstein roots and themes and ideas. Thus, it makes perfect sense that Cortex would eventually realize this and want to try it again. In fact, while it's never actually said, I like to think that the reason Cortex was so secretive about Crunch's development is partly due in fact to, one, he knew that it was a very dangerous gamble considering what happened last time he tried to uh, get a bandicoot to work for him, and number two, maybe he even intended on keeping that as a sort of trump card to get rid of Uka Uka in the future. There must be something we can come up with. Say, Doctor, haven't you been tinkering with some kind of new secret weapon in your laboratory? I don't know what you're talking about, Entropy. Dr. Cortex, I think he's referring to this super secret weapon you've been laboring over day and night since the last time Crash defeated you. Enough bickering! Do we have a plan? But that's just my headcanon and not at all in the actual game's story, mind you. At any rate, Crunch conceptually is a really cool new rival for Crash. But, sadly enough, after all those cutscenes, he's kind of half-heartedly actually introduced via this computer screen talkie thing. Crash Bandicoot, my old nemesis. How the heck are you? Still gathering crystals? Old habits die hard, don't they? My days are being spent on something much more intriguing. Meet Crunch, my newest creation. <laughs> This is the creature who keeps sabotaging your master plan? Ha! <laughs> you gotta be kidding! I'll exterminate this field right in no time! Now, Crunch, your time with Crash will come soon enough. Isn't he brilliant? A testament to my true scientific genius. A real bandicoot warrior. Unlike you, Crash. Fuck you, oh, bitch! Well, we which I think is a real shame. I think it would have been so, so cool to have a cutscene. We see Crunch being first sort of revealed. Maybe there could be kind of like a reversal of the first cutscene of Crash 1 or something where it actually goes correctly this time. But, oh well. Actually, for the most part, story-wise, Crash the Wrath of Cortex is pretty interesting. Although, on a non-story related note, I think these character models are a significant downgrade from Crash Warped. They are just so much more stiff and lifeless. Cortex in particular really fucking looks off-model and weird. Same thing goes for Injun, and ugh, what did they do to Entropy? And Crash, he looks okay, but still off. I think it's the fact that one of his eyes is so much bigger than the other, and they both blink at different times. Ugh. Now sometimes Crash's eyes had this effect back in Warped and Crash 2 as well, but it was a much more subtle and could almost be interpreted as Crash lowering an eyebrow, whereas here he has two distinctly different sized eyes. And also the Coco model just looks dead inside. And actually, really one of the only good models in this game are probably the masks, which look pretty decent, and Crunch Bandicoot himself. However, this is one of the first next-gen games of that time, and these guys had only 12 months to put it together, so it's mostly a nitpick. Though if I'm really splitting hairs here, Jack and Daxter 1 also came out quite close to that time as well, and it looks a whole lot better than this, uh, to uh, put it lightly. But overall, it is all the same, very disappointing, especially with how animated and cartoony the original trilogy was, and how it only improved and got more emotive and expressive with each game, whereas this is a clear downgrade outside of your basic ass lighting effects and particle effects, I suppose. Anyway, moving on from story and early concepts, I think it's about time we talk about the gameplay 
of Crash the Wrath of Cortex. Now, I've watched quite a few videos about this game, from reviews to retrospectives to video essays and beyond. And one thing that has kind of become customary to do when discussing this game is going through each level in order and discussing one's thoughts as you go along. If I'm not mistaken, I think Catacarus's old video about the game was the first to ever do this. But regardless, I think the reason this has become the format at which it's done is because Crash The Wrath of Cortex has a lot of strange one-off levels. There's a lot of new types of levels, and in general, this game repeats its themes far less than Crash 2 or 3. If one is to talk about the gameplay of this game, when new gameplay is constantly being introduced to the player in said game, it just naturally makes sense to go over them all in order. So I will be doing the same here. But with all that said, let's jump right into it. Starting with... Arctic Antics. This is an interesting first level. I think most people point out how different it is for the first level to be a, a snow-themed one in most reviews. Though I suppose technically any one of these first five levels could have been the first one that you picked, since this game works on the exact same structure as Crash Warped in 2, but all the same, stylistically, it is an interesting choice. Now in the past three games, the first levels were careful to introduce different elements to the player in a way that eased them into the gameplay and structure of the game. Here, this level also does that, but at a much more breakneck speed. This level establishes the core gameplay of the game. That is, spinning, platforming, dodging obstacles, collecting crystals, and getting from point A to point B. You can also go for the gem if you collect all the boxes in the level, which is fairly easy to do. As well as, strangely enough, this first level also introduces death routes something that they usually reserve till later levels in Crash 2 and 3. This is definitely a break from normalcy, but I'm actually not opposed to the idea of showing it early, as new players can either quickly figure out why this platform has a skull and bones on it, while experienced Crash fans can instantly jump into a more difficult challenge, rewarding you with the first colored gem. The music of this level is also pretty catchy and bouncy, and actually as we go forward, that is one of the major positives of this game, is it has some really interesting and funky tracks. Not every one of the tracks is a banger, mind you, and I don't really know how many I would listen to outside of the confines of the game, but for the game, they usually fit pretty well. Overall, I'd say this is a pretty interesting first level, though it does introduce some of the more strange elements and quirks that are universal to this game, one being the more dynamic camera. The camera is moving in and out a lot, and even moves with you when you jump, though that last feature is actually more of an annoyance than anything since it only serves to make certain platforming challenges a bit more difficult, or at least a little more awkward. I suppose I could also note that while Crash has an almost identical moveset to what he had in Crash Warped, though you do have to unlock all the extra moves again, there is a distinct lack of snap in performing one move from another. The slide jump, for example, which I consider to be one of the most fun and creative and unique moves for any kind of platformer character, is here. But while performing it was quick and sharp, allowing you to instantly react to upcoming platforming challenges and enemies, in this game, Crash feels far more lethargic, slow, floatier in general in all of his moves, from his basic spin to his slide jump. You do kind of get used to it after a while, but it just doesn't feel as good as Crash 2 or 3. In a 3D platformer, making the character fun to move around as, to platform with, is the key element in what separates the good ones from the mediocre ones from the bad ones, all the way to the great ones that stand above all others. Whether the 3D character has a very simple moveset to a very complex one isn't actually all that important, so long as it is fun to play around with, that it feels good. The original trilogy of Crash games not only had this element, 
but also improved upon this idea of each entry. Here it feels like a massive step backwards. Crash doesn't feel that good to platform with here, and so no matter what this game throws at me, it just doesn't feel as satisfying as it did in the other games. The game is always slightly playing catch up with my button inputs, and I'm unsure if this was an intentional design choice or if the devs just never quite replicated the controls and game feel for the character of Crash Wright in that year they had in development. But either way, this is the final result, so we gotta deal with it. But keep that word I said earlier in mind, lethargic going forward. In spite of the downgrading controls, this first level isn't too bad of a start design-wise. Tornado Alley. And right off the bat, we're jumping into a plane level where you are constantly hearing the sound effect through the entirety of its runtime. <laughs> I suppose now is as good a time as any to note that in analyzing this game for this retrospective, I decided to play it on both the GameCube, because that's the version that I grew up with, as well as the Xbox version, since that one is often considered to be the best version of the game. This way I could give the game the best chance it could possibly get. I also played a bit of the PS2 version, but not that much. I'll note the differences between the GameCube version and the Xbox version as we go throughout, but of note is that in the Xbox version, this constant loud noise has been fixed. In general, the Xbox version can kind of be considered a patched version of the game, and while it doesn't fix all the game's issues, it does try to get rid of some of the more glaring ones that I'll get into later. Also, Crash has a fur texture in the Xbox version, so there's that, I suppose. Also, everyone notes this, but it is very much worth mentioning as well that on the PS2 version, the load times for levels are unbearably slow, with some of them taking up to 20 seconds just to load into and out of. This was again fixed in the GameCube and Xbox versions, as well as the greatest hits edition of the PS2 game as well. Oh yeah, the level itself? Uh, it's super fucking easy and ends in less than a minute if you know what you're doing. I suppose it's not unlike those in Warp to be fair, so moving on. Bamboozled. Ah, now this is the first of a brand new type of reoccurring level type in this game. Atlasphere levels. Atlasphere levels are basically where the gameplay turns into a pseudo, a monkey ball like stage where there's no platforming, but rather it's all ball-based physics. You roll around, and you crash things up, and generally try to avoid falling off the edge and running into nitro crates. The physics and feel for this gameplay style is actually really fun and satisfying. There's a good amount of tension and a major amount of momentum that you can pull off while zooming through these levels at a fast pace. There's a nice flow to this type of level, this one in particular in my opinion, so much so that you can tell a lot of time went into the development of this gameplay style, what with there being 5 out of the 30 levels in this game being dedicated to it, after all. I'll talk more in depth about this gameplay style more later, as more levels come along, but I do in particular love the tubes and downward spirals of this level. It almost gives me a a similar feeling to that of Sonic the Hedgehog spin dashing down a hallway. It is simply pleasing to the palate, especially when you're going after the relic here. Wizards and Lizards. Back to a standard platforming level, this one is actually very good. I love the music here and general theming of the level. It sort of feels like a Cortex Castle level or an extension of the uh, medieval levels from Warped. Though of all the level themes, this type feels probably the most far removed from the natural disaster themes of the game, generally speaking. There's this cool dragon chase halfway through the level, which is pretty fun, and overall this level just feels like your old-fashioned classic crash level. Something akin to the Triceratop chase levels, the Jurassic levels of Crash Warp. Uh, besides the inferior controls, of course. Of note here is that this level also has a death route, which leads to another color gem, which I bring up again because this game has a rather strange oversight regarding its gems. See, in Crash 2 and Warped, with very few exceptions, it's pretty difficult to finish a level with the crystal 
the gem, and the color gem of that level in one single playthrough. This was either because the color gem was actually accessed through a secret path in a different level, or the color gem was downright a different route from the main path of the level, or required you to come back with a new ability to get it, or while one gem you need to break all the boxes, the other gem you needed to break none of the boxes. You get the point. This was done so you had to really explore and have reasons to come back to levels in order to 100% the game. While in Crash the Wrath of Cortex, every single colored gem is always stowed away via a death route, meaning that there is no longer any hidden paths and secret connections between levels like in 2 or 3. But also you can access the color gems on your first attempt of every level that has one so long as you don't die on the way to the death route of course. I'll get back to that point in a second, but herein lies an interesting oversight. When you go to a death route in say Wizards and Lizards and grab the green gem, there is a warp thingy right there to exit the level so that you can go back into it and attempt to get the crystal and normal gem if you hadn't gotten them yet. Or at least it serves as a convenient way to exit the level if you're coming back to this level to get the green gem. However, once you get the color gem, you can actually just die right here and you will still have the color gem in your inventory upon your next life. Meaning that you can actually 100% nearly every level besides the relics upon your first playthrough if you're good enough at the game to know this knowledge ahead of time. And of course, not die on the way to the death route. Bear in mind you can die in the death route and continue to keep accessing it so long as you don't die on your way to the death route. Now this funnily enough does make completing this game far easier than before, but it's also a clear mistake they never accounted for the player doing that never got fixed, even in the Xbox version. There are some people that actually prefer this design though, oversight or no, and really enjoy the fact that getting all the gems is far easier in this game than the last three. With YouTuber Penguin in Pajamas video titled, The Wrath of Cortex is consistently frustrating, being of this opinion, as he thought that getting the gems in Crash 2 in Warp was far too cryptic. Hot take? I actually think this is an improvement. Collecting all the gems in the old games was a massive headache. Not knowing which gems were accessible, having to backtrack without being able to actually see behind you, that one level that's only accessible by being killed by this specific pterodactyl, yes, really. And that red gem that hovers so temptingly, just out of reach that you spend hours trying to work out how to get to it, but you just can't figure it out so you have to look it up online and it turns out you were supposed to go to an entirely different level. Then jump across these crates in order to get to this platform, which for some reason teleports you into a secret warp room with another entrance to the first level you're in, except this time you start in a new area which has an impossibly difficult ice skating section that eventually drops you right on top of it. Of course, why didn't I think of that earlier? which I wholeheartedly disagree with. This is not to throw shade, mind you. This video is actually very interesting in that he looks at a lot of the mistakes and flaws of Crash the Wrath of Cortex's design. And there are several points he makes that I actually very much do agree with him on, like the awful sneaking power-up being uh, awful, which we'll get to shortly, or the dynamically moving cameras being unnecessary at best and intrusive at worst. Or the first level may be introducing too many things to the player at once versus the more careful approach the original trilogy took in showcasing all the game's core mechanics to the player at a slower pace. Which I agree with somewhat, even though I personally think the first level of this game is actually pretty good. Though I will concede that yes, it is far more haphazardly put together than the careful design of the original trilogy. But anyway, the big point here being, Gone is the level design that pushes the player to explore and find out all the secrets that the game has in store, so that you can one day master it fully. And in its place, we have a game that accidentally rewards you for killing yourself. Compactor Reactor Okay, so this one is interesting. The level starts with a minecart ride that eventually leads into this laboratory mining facility. This is noteworthy because it is a remnant of the original concept when Crash was meant to explore four levels 
and then beat a fifth level that works as a sort of home base for Cortex's minions on that planet. Every fifth level in each of the five sections of the warp room is a level that starts as something else that eventually leads into a Cortex laboratory base. Though obviously here, the other four levels don't follow an exact theme. You could play the fifth level as well first if you wanted to, and these aren't four planets, it's just different sets of levels. Still, it is interesting knowing this now, because as a kid, I always liked playing the fifth level of each of these sets of levels last, because the laboratory theme felt like a natural transition point for the boss battle of that set of levels. I was one of those kids that would play games so many fucking times in a row that I would start creating an optimal path that I believed was the best way to play the game, and would even have this narrative going on in my brain about the main villain communicating to the main hero and all sorts of other stuff. So, finding out that my stupid little kid headcanning was actually at least slightly correct is quite funny in retrospect. Anyway, these fifth levels in a warp room to me are usually very interesting aesthetically because of the transition from a dangerous natural area into a cortex lab, since it kind of works as a microcosm of the core aesthetic and themes of Crash Bandicoot nature versus technology, the natural versus the unnatural, which is actually extra interesting because Cortex is using the four elements, nature against nature, also echoed through Crunch versus Crash Bandicoot. What I'm saying is, this concept holdover from the original concept of Crash Worlds is one of the best elements of this game by far, in my opinion. And speaking of elements, of the four main elemental factories, this factory represents the element of Earth. And while I just praised a bunch of elements about this game, now it's time that I got addressing one of the most glaring issues of this game. Empty space. This topic is unfortunately going to come up in several other levels in this game. But this is the first one where it becomes rather obvious. There are obstacles that can be entirely walked around. Enemies that throw grenades in one spot and never move around at all. These weird elements come up a lot in this game. Because all the levels in this game, while linear, often are made wider than they were in the original games. Which means certain obstacles can pathetically just be walked past without even engaging with it. Now I think the reason some levels are designed this way is to make the levels feel more wide open, to give you a little more breathing room, perhaps to showcase more of the uh, power and capabilities of the consoles of that time. But there is never really an actual gameplay purpose for the levels being more wide. I'm jumping ahead of myself a bit here, but level 6 Jungle Rumble have these exact same wide halls and areas but absolutely nothing to do in them. No extra boxes, no hidden paths, no extra enemies, etc. Hell, in the first area like this in that level, there's this giant pool of water that just serves as a means of killing you and nothing else. In the pursuit of trying to make this game look as if it is bigger and better than the originals, they sacrifice the tightly designed halls of the original trilogy, especially since the enemies legit have worse AI in this game than they do in Crash 2 and 3. And even in some cases where they are comparable, they are still a threat in the OG trilogy because they were unavoidable. You must run, jump, or spin past them in those games. Whereas here, you can just leisurely stroll by them without any care in the world. It makes this level and many others feel hollow, and oddly enough, more devoid of life than they were before. This could have been completely redeemed if some of the enemies at least interacted with you on a better scale, like they at least tried to aim their grenades or weapons at you. Then the wider hallways would actually make perfect sense because it gives you more room to work around the obstacles. At the very least, not every single level in Crash the Wrath of Cortex is designed this way, as I've already showcased two levels that were designed quite well. But there is enough levels like this that it becomes a rather glaring flaw with the game.
Boss One, Rocco. What are you looking at, fuzzhead? I'm Rocco, the Earth Elemental. Uka Uka and Dr. Cortex woke me from my captive slumber, and now I'm free to pulverize whatever gets in my way. Oh, don't even think about collecting those crystals, Grunt. Because if you do, I'm going to bury you alive. In a similar fashion to Crash Warp, the bosses of this game talk to you via little cutscenes between levels. However... Oh, I'm going to shake, rattle, and roll your bandicoot butt. While these cutscenes serve the purpose of introducing these bosses to the player and getting a sense of their personalities as well as building them up a bit in Crash Warped, in this game, I guess it also does that as well, but these masks are literally just one personality trait, and that personality trait is making puns about whatever element that they are. I know I'm skipping ahead a bit here, but take a look at some of these. They're gonna have to hang you out to dry when I get through with you! Hope you drop your sunscreen, cause you're gonna burn! Is there a draft in here? It's just so cheesy and dumb. It doesn't help either that while they are each an element of the boss battles, <laughs> the main bosses of every warp room is actually Crunch Bandicoot, using one of these four elemental masks. A lot of people are mixed on this. Uh, some people hate that the only boss that you actually fight in this game is Crunch Bandicoot, with a different elemental mask rather than the colorful cast of villains and minions that you would go off against before. While on the other hand, many think that it's really cool that this new boss character is given ample time to fight Crash multiple times, like an ongoing rival for Crash to overcome. I personally fall into this latter camp, as I really like Crunch conceptually, and I love the idea of fighting him multiple times with different power-ups. It's a Bandicoot versus Bandicoot. That being said, I do think Crunch doesn't get nearly enough screen time to actually talk. I mean, he does talk a fair bit, but it's usually just, I'm gonna freaking get you, Crash Bandicoot, and not much else. Well, well, looks like the Bandicoot's been busy collecting crystals. I warned you, Bandicoot. Finally, I get to wrap my fingers around your puny orange neck. I feel like the elemental masks, while cool, should have been bantering with Crunch as they both taunt Crash Bandicoot. The few times we do get dialogue from Crunch, as I said, he is just a typical bad guy who wants to defeat you. But I feel like there could have been so much room for more. Maybe he could have even disregarded and disagreed and bickered with the elemental masks as you went throughout the game, showcasing that he has a far more discordant personality and relationship with the masks than Crash does with Aku Aku. It would have been also interesting to see Crunch say literally anything to Uka Uka, or Coco for that matter. I think all this would have been a very cool contrast and it would go a long way in making these masks feel a lot more than just a pun PNG if they could banter with Crunch, even if they were still pun oriented. All that being said, the first boss is against Crunch and Rocco, and this boss is hot fucking garbage. Not because it's difficult, mind you, but because as the first boss, it doesn't make any sense. And as a boss, generally speaking, is a very silly and dumb gimmick boss fight. You see, the first boss is an atmosphere level, where Crunch jumps in a rock ball and tries to hit you. In order to beat him, you gotta touch these other rocks and turn them blue. And this, for some reason, causes a chain reaction of rocks to fall on Crunch. You do this three times, with each hit point getting another rock you gotta touch before it works, and then the boss is over. Crunch can also hit the rocks you have already hit and turn them gray again. Or if they are already gray before you're able to, like, turn them blue, you can turn the gray rocks into orange rocks. Though all this does is make them so you have to wait for them to turn gray again. As if you touch them when they're orange, you'll take another hit. But if he does manage to turn all the rocks orange, no chain reaction hurts you or whatever, even though the top of the screen almost seems to indicate something like that would happen since the game is keeping a counter of 
who's got which rocks turned what color. This is such a strange choice for a first boss. It's not platforming, it's an atmosphere level, but also with none of the strengths of a normal atmosphere level since it's in this really tight little arena where everything's on a slope and you're constantly fighting against the slope. It's, it's, it's just, it's also very peculiar, but at the same time, it's also a super easy boss battle, as there are entire swaths of time where Crunch is just kind of off mucking about on the other side of the arena, not really doing anything. The arena is also uninteresting, the boss music isn't very memorable, and overall it's just a super anticlimactic first fight against your new rival. So it's uh, not very fun in uh, my personal opinion. I'd think that this boss was poor even if it were a later one, but the fact that it is the first makes it all the more egregious in my mind. Not to mention, if you are going to design a boss battle around the atmosphere, I feel like it would make way more sense to use the momentum mechanics of that gameplay style. Like, maybe you have to like actually charge and touch Crunch's rock, so you can like knock him off an edge or into a pool of lava or some kind of thing like that. Because as it is, this battle arena just makes you fight against the controls and the fun factor of this gameplay style to begin with. To add to all of this, after defeating the first boss, you then get your first new power-up and the only new ability this game adds, the infamous sneaking move. <laughs> so, this sneaking ability is something that is in nearly every review of Crash the Wrath of Cortex on YouTube. From basic few minute reviews to longer retrospectives, everybody brings it up, and for good reason. It's the only new platforming a mechanic the game gives you and is extremely situational. Silly looking and adds nothing really to the core gameplay. The ability allows you to sneak over nitro crates, but there are only like three to four or five, I forget the exact number, or so situations where this is actually a mandatory mechanic to get through a section. And as I noted before in the Crash Warp section of this retrospective, every ability in that game, besides the super belly flop I suppose, was designed to give you more platforming abilities and make traversing through obstacles both easier, but also got fully utilized through optimization in the time trials of that game. The sneaky move adds nothing other than a slow and lethargic means of getting over a row of nitros. After all, it's fun to jump over and in between TNT and nitro crates. It's fun to double jump over them. It's fun to slide jump over them. It's fun to double jump and slide triple spin over them, whatever. It's not very much fun to just slowly walk over them. Like I said, most people when discussing this game brings up this boring power-up. Some videos about the game even having it as their thumbnail. But the one thing I never hear people bring up are suggestions for what they would have for a new power-up in place of the sneaky shoes. It's easy to point out a bad new ability, but coming out with a new one, especially when this game already includes all of Crash's stacked moveset from Warped, but, you know, just way floatier edition of them, is far more difficult. Mind you, this is not me criticizing anyone for not coming up with a new move for Crash to use. I just really personally enjoy when others give their own ideas in place of the ideas that were there that they felt didn't work. So with that in mind, here's an idea I came up with that could have made for a more interesting power-up for Crash in place of these notorious sneaky shoes. I call it the spin slide. Made in the same vein as the slide jump, this move would propel Crash forward with a slide, but instead of pressing the jump button, you would press the spin button, which would serve as both a means of spinning quicker into enemies or groups of boxes, but would also allow Crash to do a sort of glide move across pits, sort of delaying his fall in a similar fashion to a Looney Tunes cartoon, 
before you would then jump up and out of the slide spin, allowing you to sort of glide over a section of Bottomless Pit. While the slide jump is all about getting vertical height, the slide spin would be all about getting horizontal movement. You could then design some jumps in the game to be extra far, so you, that you have to use this move every once in a while especially on death roots but also also this ability could be comboed and fully optimized with your other moves for example you could spin slide off of a ledge double jump out of that and then tornado spin across the rest of the way giving you maximum movement ability another smaller but important mechanic of the slide spin would be that the jump that you do out of it would have a little bit more momentum than a normal jump. Now, of course, ideally, if you were to introduce a move like this into the game, you would have some level designs utilize a skill and maybe have some of the death roots actually be challenging. But it would also be a move that doesn't necessarily replace anything and is more so just a another tool in your set for platforming. But that's just my idea for a new crash move. Let me know what you think about this potential new move in the comments down below. Let me know if you think that would be a cool idea for a move or not. And more importantly, if you have any suggestions for a new move for Crash Bandicoot. Something that isn't necessarily situational, but something that adds to the core gameplay of Crash. But at any rate, moving on. Jungle Rumble. First level, the second hub of levels. And this one is aesthetically and atmosphere-wise actually really quite nice. I love the rainforest look, and the music really sets this lovely mood. Sadly, that's where my praises end, as this was one of those levels that has really wide open spaces, as I noted before, with nothing to do. Enemies that act like cardboard cutouts, and a chase section in a jeep that's... it's, it's okay, actually. But nothing groundbreaking. This level also has this exclusive little enemy that looks kind of like a weird little sonic-eyed tribesman of some sort. It's really out of place visually, and they're just kinda... kinda, kinda weird. This level could have been a lot better if it were more tightly designed, with maybe some ancient ruins like the rolling hazards and the like. Or if there was ever actually any secrets to be found or different paths to be taken in this oddly wide level design. Seashell Shenanigans Alright, now here's where the game design starts hitting its stride and just how awful it can possibly get. Seashell Shenanigans is the first of this game's swimming levels, which are some of the absolute worst levels in the game. See, I was never the biggest fan of the swimming levels in Crash Warped, but I never found them insufferable. I cannot say the same for the ones in Crash The Wrath of Cortex. The sluggish controls make maneuvering these levels, and this one in particular, an absolute chore. That, combined with the wide up and down angles making you overextend yourself looking for hidden boxes just in case, and some of the worst enemies in the game, these dumb red bomb things that fall on you if you pass over them, and are often hidden up and above you out of sight, these things make maneuvering through these levels either a constant spinning fest to get through them as fast as possible, or a slog to slowly swim through until you bait them out, depending on where you are. These things feel a bit cheap if you aren't aware of them ahead of time, but normally I would just suggest keep spinning and going through the levels as fast as possible, and you should be okay for the most part. But what makes these stages far, far worse is the fact that you can't actually always do that because of the inclusion of this circular submarine. In Crash Warped, there are these sections in the underwater where you get this like underwater jet ski type thing that allows you to blow up everything with torpedoes, boost super fast, blow up coral, and take an extra hit if you got damaged. These were by far the best parts of the warped underwater levels in my opinion. On the other hand, the submarine in this game gives you torpedoes and bombs, 
that you can shoot from below you, which seems pretty cool, until you realize that this sub takes FOREVER to turn. Instead of just turning left to right, since this is a side-scrolling stage, there's this weird and entirely useless middle state where Crash faces the screen before you fully turn from left to right or vice versa. This makes turning ungodly lethargic, which beyond adding to the terrible feel of the gameplay, this actually becomes a problem when combined with those red bombs that fall from above, as well as the other obstacles of course, because you now have a much bigger hitbox. You turn like the game is actively fighting against you. You're forced into getting into this sub, and unlike Crash Warp, where the underwater vehicle gives you an extra hit, but you're rewarded if you keep it through the whole section to get the hidden boxes in the coral, in this game, if you get hit in this overly slow to turn, bigger hitbox machine, it shares your normal health, and so you can die in one hit unless you have the Aku Aku Mask, of course. This makes going through these levels an even bigger chore, because now you have to slowly move forward, spamming the fire button so that you don't get hit by the bombs or anything else. All because they just had to include this weird in-between state where Crash looks at the camera and there is literally no benefit or use case for this ever. Now, I've done this level in this game so many times that I can do it pretty effortlessly and quickly by now, but it is nonetheless an awfully designed level, a terribly designed vehicle, and on top of that, the level is just so uninteresting. The music just drones on and on, the visuals are alright I suppose, and some of the fishes do look kind of creepy and cool, so I will give the level at least that, but that's really all it's got going for it. Even if I don't find the level particularly difficult at this point, it is still a tedious level to go through, as well as all the others of its ilk. <clears throat> so, in short, I don't like it very much. Bonsai Bonsai. So, for the next level, we have the first of the Coco levels in this game and the first in the Crash franchise where you get to play as Coco in a platforming stage. Now, before I move forward into this, I'd like to point something out that a lot of people seem to say about this game when discussing the Coco levels. See, Coco controls pretty much the exact same as Crash in this game, but without any of his new abilities like the slide jump, the double jump, the tornado spin, etc. I think the only move that she can get later on in the game is the running ability. This makes her moveset far more limiting than Crash's. From the several reviews and retrospectives that I've watched over the course of doing research for this video, people tended to be rather mixed on this decision. Some people didn't necessarily mind that she played differently. Others minded a whole lot and found that her gameplay was just way worse than normal Crash's. And some people even thought that the reason she plays differently, the reason that she plays worse than normal Crash, is because the developers were sexist or something. This is a really silly take though, for two reasons. One, narratively, and the other gameplay-wise. The obvious narrative reason she has less moves than Crash isn't because she's a girl, but because platforming through stages is new for her. She is the smarts after all. Her strong suit has been her intellect. Piloting spaceships, riding on tigers or jet skis. Hell, the entire reason that they're in this warp room is through this big supercomputer virtual reality thing that she made. She also, unlike Crash, has a voice. Or at least talks a hell of a lot more than Crash chooses to, I suppose. So narratively, there is a justification for why she has less moves. Not because she's a girl, but because Crash and Coco have different strong suits. However, her gameplay makes even more sense when you look at it from a purely gameplay perspective. Coco can jump, spin, and run her way through levels with no fancy tricks at her disposal for getting through the challenges, pushing the player to rely solely on good timing 
and meeting the level's challenge with their limited toolset. Hmm. Now where have I heard this before? Oh yeah! These levels are an obvious callback to the way Crash platformed and controlled through levels in Crash 1. And while you can still be of the opinion that this is a dumb creative choice, it is very clearly not for any supposed sexist reasons. You silly, silly scallywags, you. All that being said, yes, she is a downgrade from Crash's moveset. But I actually don't mind this level here. The Asian theming, the music, the interesting little dragon and ninja enemies, it makes for an aesthetically pleasing level. And while if I had my dream Crash game, I would ideally have Coco either control like Crash, or maybe have some unique abilities of her own, utilizing her technology like hover boots in place of a double jump, for example. I also don't mind the Crash 1 callback since, uh, I mean, I love Crash Bandicoot 1. The only problem being the controls are still much more sluggish and floaty than they were in Crash 1. So even in that regard, it is by no means a one-to-one -one comparison. But an attempt was certainly made. I also really love this section where the camera moves above Coco in this little maze section. This is a perspective you never really see in Crash games, and it comes and goes so naturally that I never even considered that this is the only time they ever use this perspective in the game. It's sort of a fun change of pace overall, and a far more tightly designed level than the previous two of this warp room. Oh, and also, you can actually unlock the super body slam attack in this level via the red gym path, which is cool, if not a little bit random, but noteworthy all the same, I suppose. That sinking feeling. That sinking feeling is one of the most bizarre levels in the game to me. For one, it is absolutely chaotic, with gunfire and explosions going off constantly. Crash is riding on a robot bug flying thing. It's the only level where this vehicle ever appears. It has a unique gameplay mechanic in which it doesn't fire like any sort of projectile unless you lock onto your target first, and features Crash in a pair of goggles that he never wears anywhere else. This level is an absolute barrage on the senses, and gameplay-wise, feels just as boring as any other plane level, but way more annoying with how the missile lock-on works. But again, don't let all the loud noises and shit confuse you. It is still just a fly around in a circle until you blow up all the targets level. It's really not hard once you know how everything works, but it also is a level that development time was put into that feels pretty damn pointless. H2, oh no. All right, final level, the second set of the warp room. And this level starts off in another awful swimming section with all the same issues I stated before being present, before then transitioning into an underwater cortex base, which is actually a fairly decent level from here on. I like some of the thin margin for air rooms with the electrical floors and general aesthetic. There's some nice elements of platforming here but it also suffers from really dumb enemies that once again just kind of stand there. Though this level in general is at least a little bit more tightly put together uh, than the first one of this kind. But again, not studying anything too, too new here. The music here slaps though. Boss 2, Wawa. Before I get into this boss, I should note that all the masks are voiced by fairly iconic actors here, with Rocco being voiced by Tom Wilson, also known for playing uh, the antagonist Biff Tannen from the Back to the Future trilogy. Wawa is voiced by R. Lee Ermey, well known for voicing Sergeant Hartman in Full Metal Jacket, as well as several other military-type characters. 
Pyro is voiced by Mark Hamill, who obviously played Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars films, but he's also very well known for playing the Joker in the Batman the Animated Series. And finally, Lolo, voiced by Jess Harnell, who has quite the expansive list of voice acting performances over the years. But funnily enough, he's actually the current voice actor for Crash in all the new games. And he also voices Wacko Warner from the Animaniacs. Anyway, this has no bearing on anything, I just figured I'd note it. At any rate, the second boss is a lot better than the first. Crunch and Wawa throw these energy powers over at you that you gotta jump over while you get across these platforms until you reach him, spin him, and rinse and repeat. Do this four times, dodging new attacks with each hit besides the very last one, and you win. This boss is all about platforming and doing what Crash does best, so it's overall pretty decent. Now, what's interesting is nearly every review I watched on Crash the Wrath of Cortex had people saying that this boss was really hard, or even unfair in some cases. And, I gotta be real, I uh... I just don't understand what they're talking about. It's a pretty basic platforming boss, and he always uses the exact same pattern of attacks each time, so if you mess up on any part of the boss, it's easy to remember that he's gonna do the same thing again next time. So I really don't understand why so many people have issues with this boss in particular. I can give some benefit of the doubt that maybe this is the case because of the lethargic controls messing people up, since this boss does demand some level of mastery over basic jumps and slide jumps in order to beat it. And in order to have that, you need to make sure that you understand how the platforming works in this game. But uh, <clears throat> there does seem to be a little bit of a small, minute, tiny, but still significant skill issue involved here. But I guess I can understand at least a little bit why someone going from the tight controls of the original trilogy and then playing this one could struggle at least a little bit, but only a little bit. But all the same, I think this boss is really fucking easy and is over in less than a minute, so whatever. Onward to the next set of five levels, starting with the Gauntlet. This is another Cortex Castle level, and just like the first of its kind earlier, it's also a pretty damn good level, with me and my thoughts mirroring the exact same for this one, though the added boost to difficulty here is very much appreciated. There's this one section where the camera is like all, I don't know, just completely out of whack, so that's kind of weird. But on the other hand, there's also the death route of this level, which is a really fun one, with you having to be bobbing and weaving over all these large swords and maces on these rotating poles. It's a nice change of pace, especially when most of the death routes in this game are just simple hallways with lots of nitro to jump over. Which can be cool, don't get me wrong, but it is definitely overplayed and gets rather repetitive as far as these and the colored gem paths go in this game, both of which usually being completely set and full of nitro crates and nothing much more. Tsunami. Another Coco level, and another Asian inspired level. This level is pretty okay, for the most part. I do like the rain and general vibe here, and the tsunami chase where you ride away from it on a pink scooter is pretty fun and memorable. But then we get to the colored gem path in this level, which is probably the most difficult in the game, but mainly for a really, really poor reason. And the primary reason I say that is because of these silver crate towers that you must jump from one over to the other in order to progress. This right here, what you're looking at, is some objectively bad level design. Now, the reason I say that is because you need to play as Coco, who has a much more limited jump and general moveset. The game is asking you to jump on these one crate wide platforms multiple times, which is Actually, not too difficult of a task to pull off. The issue here isn't actually that it's requiring you to jump on these crates. The issue is that the camera is sat too low to be able to properly see where your shadow is until it's too late and you have either landed the jump or missed it. Now, a lot of people complain about depth perception in 3D platformers. And I gotta be real with you. a lot of the time, the complaint is totally unwarranted. For example, in Crash 1, while yes, 
The bridge levels are hard, and yes, it is asking a lot from the player. The one thing that keeps those levels being perfectly fair though, is that you can always see your shadow and where you're going to land, allowing you to move forward and stop moving forward with confidence that you're going to land in that place. It can still take some practice to get used to, but once you understand this and the arc of your jump, these levels can be easily conquered. Here, however, I'd say depth perception is actually playing a factor, as this dynamic camera has made this area artificially much more difficult by the fact that you need to jump on higher platforms with pinpoint accuracy. You can't rely on your shadow because it doesn't show up on the platform until it's too late. You can't rely on just the arc of your jump either because it's actually very easy to overshoot the towers as well. Which again, you will not be able to see exactly if you did that due to the camera angle being too low until you've already missed it. And since Coco has a very limited move set, there will be no way of correcting the mistake. Once again, Penguin in Pajamas video showcases the issue that Crash of the Wrath of Cortex has with its camera and how it is fundamentally different from the original trilogy. One of the clever tricks the older games used was to put the camera on a fixed track. It was mainly for technical reasons, so that they could hide far away parts of the level that hadn't loaded yet, but a side effect was that you always had a pretty good idea of where Crash was going to land. The Wrath of Cortex uses a dynamic camera, which moves up and down to follow Crash whenever he jumps. I mean, sure, it looks nice, but it makes it way harder to track where you're going to land, especially when you double jump. I mean, look, you can't even see the platform anymore. They've moved the camera closer to the ground as well. It's a bit subtle, but it makes a big difference in perspective. I mean, which one of these crates looks easier to jump on to you? So in other words, the landing zone is near impossible to see without jumping, which is life or death here in this section. The section is artificially more difficult because it's not dependent on your skills at the game to beat it, but rather forces you to kind of jump blindly and go off of your gut feeling alone. If the camera was adjusted to be more at an angle, or how even if it was just over the head like the other Coco level, you would be able to far more easily see your character in relation to the platform. Or hell, if the camera was just at least fixed, this would be far more easy as well. But no, instead we have this dynamic camera, which is completely, unequivocally useless, and serves only to the detriment of the player if they're not good enough to compensate for this. Now all that being said, when I did this on the GameCube, I was still easily able to get through this section with just a couple of attempts, because I've played 3D platformers enough to kind of know the feeling of when I'm going to land or not. But even then, this area still trips me up. But unfortunately, upon playing the game on the Xbox, I found myself struggling here a lot more, which I honestly really couldn't tell you why that was. This section does have really bad level design, but it seems that my jump through the bullshit level design anyway skills were clearly failing me upon my second playthrough. I hate to say it, but I'm mad enough. It was clearly a skill issue, even if that skill in particular was blindly jumping across a uh, shallow pool of water on one buck sized towers under the worst camera conditions imaginable. Now, all that being said, luckily this is the only section where this issue with the camera and depth perception becomes an actual big issue. And like I said, you can sort of feel your way through it if you're good enough. But this is all the same, a really bad section of the game. And again, since people often bring up the depth perception argument when it comes to 3D platformers, without ever actually explaining what they mean by that, other than, I can't make this jump, I kind of felt the need to showcase an example where I believe that perception is actually playing a factor in a section being artificially more difficult due to the bad camera 
and the way that that section was designed versus what it is like at least 90 to 95 percent of the time it just being a hard section that you need to get better at. Smokey and the Bandicoot. Speaking of bad sections, this whole level is unapologetically awful on nearly every front that you could possibly imagine. It's a racing level that uses this Jeep that, besides this on-rail section back in Jungle Rumble, where it controlled completely differently for some reason, is the only level in the game that fully utilizes this vehicle. What's more is the controls on this vehicle are some of the worst car-related controls that I have ever used in any game, period. It's like this sandy road has ice physics, while the wheels are always trying to resist whatever you tell them to do, and the jeep moves on a delay. All these strange movement quirks make going through this level, be it through getting the crystal by finishing the race in first place, or slowly and methodically coming through the level to get the gem, and somehow still missing boxes because of how broken turning or even making the slightest of adjustments. It is a constant chore. The always around this time makes me start to question why I'm bothering playing this game again. On top of that, there are pits that are hard to avoid due to the controls and other players that can easily knock you out of the way and into the pits. If you mess up even once, you can kiss coming in first goodbye, and the level requires a reset. And sometimes I swear when I turn the Jeep, it will just refuse to do what I say, and will stay the course into certain doom. It's a real shame. Like I said, I loved the motorcycle levels in Crash Warp, and found their controls to be fun and intuitive, if a bit stiff. And this could have been a level of similar quality, a nice change of pace, but instead is just an annoying level that even if I beat it on my first try, I'm still not having any fun with due to how terrible and unsatisfying it feels to control. Oh, and also you're racing the other boss characters from the past games here. That is at least a cool detail, so I'll give the level that one little thing. That's kind of cool, but that's literally it. Eskimo Roll. The second of the Atlasphere levels, and this one is uh, pretty good. It's maybe a bit less good than the first Atlasphere level, but still pretty good. The layout is mainly about avoiding pits on downhill slopes rather than spiraling tubes or anything like that. However, as I said before, I do find the gameplay here to be at least fairly compelling. And I even enjoy the few moments where you have to be a little bit more precise whenever going over these big pits of ice and the like. What I do not find compelling about this level, however, are the boss characters of Tiny Tiger, Dingo Dial, and Entropy being reduced to extremely easy to avoid obstacles. Now, I just praised the last level, well, for like a second anyway, about those characters being in their little cars and you having to race them. I praise that mainly because it kind of reminds me of Crash Team Racing, and it's not like they're literally brain dead in that level, which I unfortunately cannot say the same for in this one. Seriously, it is just pathetic. Tiny tries to stop you, but he can't even hurt you if you touch him. He's just a literal block that can't even move fully to the left or right. Dinko Dial is a little bit better, I guess, though, since his attack actually can hurt you and is sporadic enough that it might actually catch you off guard. Meanwhile, Entropy, God, how the mighty have fallen. All he does is just stare there and shoot in one place with this pathetic, tiny little projectile in the exact same place, reduced to the same level of intelligence as those guys throwing bombs at fucking nothing. I seriously don't know what they were thinking with this. I guess maybe they just wanted to somehow include these characters in the game somewhere, since they were there at the start of the game, but since Crunch is all the boss battles, they were kind of reduced to just being dumb obstacles. Again, obviously they were pressed for time in developing this game, but you know, it's not actually the worst idea ever to have these past boss characters show up in levels to cause you trouble since they aren't bosses anymore. But imagine if in one of the plane levels, or uh, the spaceship level that shows up later on in the game, 
If after you mindlessly destroy all the big things out in space, if out of nowhere Injun came into the level via a portal with a big mech that serves as a sort of mini boss that you gotta defeat before you get the crystal. Maybe you could have Dingle Dao show up as a mini boss washing over the third lab since it's fire themed. You could have Ripper Roo maybe washing over the second one since it's water themed. And Tiny could be washing over the first one since, I mean, I don't know, it just seems like a decent place for him. And the wooden lab could be occupied by my pride and joy, Pinstripe. Because I want him back, alright? And you know, he had this big blimp zeppelin air space level in Crash Team Racing and yeah, it, it would be cool, okay? I want more fucking pinstripe, please. Then you could maybe have Dr. Entropy appear in place of the normal mini bosses when you're trying to go after the time relic and he rewards you with extra time if you beat him. Again, I know this is stuff that realistically the devs at Traveler's Tales just didn't have time for. But man, the characters of Crash Bandicoot are so cool and lovable, it would be great to see them more often. But not like this. This... This just makes me sad. Fahrenheit Frenzy. For the final level of this bunch, we have the Volcano Laboratory. This starts off with this section where you're using a brand new vehicle that's sort of like a helipack of sorts. And this section is fine enough. It's, uh, it was kind of advertised all over the place with this game, this helipack. But it's actually only used here in the main game and in one other level we'll get to later. Though I will say that these green spotlights really don't look like they would fucking incinerate you if you touch them. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, they, they do. So, uh, guess I'm the weird one. But at any rate, after that, this level follows the general structure of these lab levels. Though it does have this really cool section where you got a platform through this x-ray vision panel. That I think helps it stand out a bit more from the rest. It also has this extremely rare power-up that turns Crash invisible and invincible for a very small window of time that serves absolutely no purpose and appears only uh, one other time in the game. And it only lasts like five seconds, if that. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's neat, I guess. My guess is that this is a holdover from some kind of new power-up that they never ended up finishing, but for some reason couldn't fully take it out of this level and the other level it appears in, so it just remains here as this completely useless power-up and mechanic. Which, if that is the case, is also weird because all this power-up does, gameplay-wise, is make you invulnerable for an extremely short amount of time. And there is already a power-up that does that. You know, the one that was in there from the very beginning since Crash 1? The Aku Aku Masks? Or maybe this power-up was meant to do something else that just never fully made it into the game. But, I don't know. You are making a mockery of me in front of my minions! Not only have you defeated the elemental masks, but you are still collecting those worthless crystals! Well, you've gotten this far, and this is as far as you're gonna get. Ah, the triumphant hero Crash, reduced to a pile of smoldering ash. Let's finish this! Boss 3, Pyro. For the third boss, we have Crunch and Pyro teaming up to turn into a lava rock thing. Gameplay-wise, this boss sees you run away from Crunch and dodge his fire rocks until you reach this mech suit that shoots water, I guess, uh, and then you chase after him now and shoot water at him. Conceptually, I actually really like this boss. Crash since the beginning has been running away from boulders and the like. Why not have him run away from a boss? Actually, now that I think about it, Crash running away from a big rock would have been a much more clever idea for an element with the Earth Elemental boss instead of the hot garbo that we got, but oh well. Anyway, in execution, I kind of find the boss feels a little weirdly unfinished. Like yeah, you run from him and jump over rocks, but when you chase after him, it's really hard to tell if you're hitting him with the water spray or if, 
like what the range of it is. And I guess for the fire element, I just kind of expected something a little bit more grand. I guess what I'm saying is the boss isn't actually too bad. In fact, it's a decent Crash Bandicoot boss. It just seems, especially for the fire element, to be a little bit undercooked. But with that said, on to the fourth set of levels. I'm going to try and start speeding things up here a little bit, since a lot of the major points about the game's design has already been discussed at this point. We're almost done, but this owl isn't done hooting yet. Avalanche. Another Coco level, this one featuring an avalanche chase on a snowboard. It's short and decent, overall, not bad. Droid Void. This level is notable in that it is the first one to introduce the mech suit. Well, that is besides, I guess, the third boss, but that's like a different colored mech suit with like a different gun, whatever. This is the mech suit that's on all the advertising of this game, even on the front cover. It's also the first time we see this sci-fi spaceship level theming. And I think that is pretty cool. But, uh, you know, that's just a little tiny issue. <clears throat> that being that this level also introduces yet another atrocious downgrade to the gameplay of this game from Warped. The climbing. This level features a near minute long climbing section where Crash slowly and methodically climbs across these grates to get to the level's first checkpoint. Once again, the word lethargic must be brought up. The climbing in this game is just so needlessly slow, it completely breaks the flow of any level that it's featured in and serves literally no purpose whatsoever being this slow. I mean, it's bad enough on a basic playthrough of the level, but let me tell ya, this level and any other that it comes up with later are absolutely terrible to get the relics in. Not even because they're hard, but because if you fail, which, you know, odds are you might fail once in a while on a relic, then you're going to have to be forced into the beginning of this level to climb across a full minute of greats every time. You're forced into this no skill, no means of going faster or skipping past them, climbing greats. The question must be asked, what were they thinking? On that note, the iconic mech suit of this game is also once again lethargic, sluggish, and a chore to move around in. You, you sense in a bit of a, a theme with Crash the Cortex yet? Mind you that sections with this thing usually aren't very difficult, but they often have you slowing down to shoot at a thing with a reticle that's very touchy and if is ever used sideways is extremely cumbersome to use. If you're moving forward with the mech, you can get a fairly basic amount of control over your jump. However, if you for any reason stop in place and then jump, there is this crazy delay and wind up in Crash actually jumping that while again, I've gotten used to over the years, just feels listless and awkward to control. And I really can't think of a reason why they would have designed it this way. You also of course don't get any extra hit from this mech suit. Meaning that if you get hit in it and you don't have an Aku Aku Mask, you die instantly. It's all the problems that I have with the sub in this game, but admittingly less bad than the sub. Mainly due to there at least being a kind of flow that you can get into with constantly moving forward with this thing that you can never really quite do with the sub. But at the same time, there is nothing Crash can do in this mech that he can't literally do better when he's on foot. I mean, hell, he even unlocks the Wumpa Bazooka after this fourth set of levels, rendering this mech suit entirely pointless. You would think it would give him some kind of cool new platform mechanic that only it can pull off, but it doesn't. It's just a more cumbersome way to play as Crash and instead of spinning, you have a bazooka that you already had anyway. Simply stunning. Crash Droids. This is just like the second level in the game, but it's space themed. 
You also play as Coco in a spaceship, which I guess is kind of cool. This level is okay, though there sure are a lot of kamikaze space fighters out here. That's kind of annoying. Also, these space stations are the exact same type that was in the opening of this game that Cortex and Co. are in. Really makes you wonder why if Coco has this kind of firepower, why doesn't she just use it to blow up the space station, I guess? Maybe their space station is bigger, or maybe the elementals are protecting it. That's cool headcanon, but uh, it's not really the case. Coral Canyon, another swimming level with the terrible sub and the like but way longer, even more tedious, and with even trickier red bombs to avoid. So, uh, needless to say, I'm not that much of a fan of this one. Withering Heights. For the fourth and final of the lab levels, we have the Skylab. However, unlike the other three, where there is a transition into the level, via minecart, submarine, or helipack, this one just sort of starts you out in the base. Maybe it was just too difficult coming out with a natural transitioning point for Crash to get onto a flying lab fortress thing, or maybe they just ran out of time and just couldn't come up with anything that would be easy enough to get done in that time. But still, it sticks out as the only one of these four to not have that cool transition. As for the level itself, it's pretty decent. I do like these glass hallways with the spinning fans and the view of the burning flying fortress we find ourselves within. Though I'm not exactly sure why it's on fire at the moment, but it's still a cool bit of visual storytelling, all the same I suppose. The level sadly enough though features several sections where you are slowly climbing on grates, which sucks ass. But overall this level is okay, with a pretty great soundtrack. other appearance of the invisible power-up. Again, serves no purpose. Cortex! Why is that mindless marsupial still collecting those crystals? He's defeated Rocco and Wawa! I'm beginning to question the value of your super weapon! I don't need another mask's help. I could take this crash punk out with my metal arm tied behind my bed. Oh, Crunch. Stop being silly. Uka, he will use the elemental masks. No need for you to lose any beauty sleep. Hey, look! The orange boy likes to fly! Time to earn your wings, kid! Boss 4, Lolo. Finally, we come to the last of the elemental mask fights. And let me just say that of all the masks personality-wise, Lolo is without a doubt the worst. Not used to the weather here, I a wimp. At least the other mask tried to be intimidating with their dumb elemental puns. This is just stupid and lazy. Also, it seemed like Pyro was the leader of the elementals since he commanded the others to fire on Aku Aku back in the beginning cutscene. But he's the third one you fight instead of the fourth. Curious. Sort of reminds me like in Crash Wart where Entropy, who seems like he should be the fourth boss, is actually the third boss. Though apparently I've heard there's some information within the beta or something that originally Pyro was going to be the last boss. I, I don't know. It, none of this really matters, but still it's, uh, it's an interesting connection all the same. As for the boss fight itself, we see Crunch and Lolo using the powers that be to become a giant tornado, which visually I think is actually the coolest of all of them. Because the others just kind of made him like, okay, like the first one, he's just in a rock circle. And the second one, he becomes water, which could have been cool, but it's, you know, he's just water for some reason. Uh, and then like the third one, he's a rock fire monster. Whereas here, he's an actual tornado. He is the big powerful element of that element, which I kind of wish the others would have done as well. Like the third boss could have been something with a volcano and lava, 
and like uh, the second boss could have had something where he like changes shapes and whatever because he's like water. Maybe you gotta freeze the water in order to attack him or whatever. So artistically, I think this boss is without a doubt one of the strongest ones in the game. Mechanically, this boss is basically uh, an engine fight, specifically the engine fight from Crash Warp, where you shoot the appendage or the weapon that he's shooting from to do damage to him while also dodging the attacks. Though unlike that boss, you don't get that satisfying click and clanks of the bullets hitting the mech, nor do you get pieces of the mech blowing up to, to fully get rid of that attack type, as well as visually showcase your progress on the fight. Here is a lot less satisfying shooting him without his speared arm blowing away or something like that. That would have been a cool way to do that. That being said, this boss isn't terrible by any means. I mean, that's not a deal breaker. It still has the bones of a great engine boss battle, which are generally some of my favorites, if not my absolute favorites in the series. It's just, again, a bit of a downgrade from engine himself. It's also a fair bit more challenging than the other bosses too, since you gotta fight him for far longer and dodge his attacks far more than you would the others. And some of his attacks are actually a bit tricky to dodge. Hell, there's this one attack that he does where he shoots this big electrical thing up into the air and you have to like fly into the right space so you don't get hit by the electrical line. And this attack is so tricky that most people that I've seen review the game don't even realize that he actually telegraphs where the safe space is. Again, not throwing shade, I just thought that was kind of funny that most people just assumed it was completely random. Well, here we are again. I wouldn't necessarily call this irony, but don't you find it a little odd that we keep meeting under these same world domination circumstances? Why not just give up? And let me win for once! Don't worry, Dr. Cortex. Now that my elemental powers have reached maximum capacity, this little geek is gonna wish he was never created. And so we get to the final warp room. All the masks have been defeated, with only Cortex and Crunch ready for the final battle awaiting you. Bring it! Bring it, Bandicoot. And to start things off, we have an actually, unironically, great level. Crash and Burn. Crash and Burn takes place on an island with a volcano erupting and causing havoc. And, huh, this looks kind of familiar. Yep, this level is the leftovers from some of those startup pitches about the game. And while that alone doesn't necessarily give or take away any points for my thoughts on this level, what does give it points is this great music. The beautiful visuals with the lava and the sunset lighting really creating an absolutely beautiful atmosphere. Add that with the genuinely good level design that actually encourages and rewards you for fully using your entire moveset that you've collected up to this point, plus the unique level setting that only gets used this once here, and this is without a doubt one of the best levels in the game by far in my opinion. Gold Rush. That great level is then followed up by a pretty damn good level as well. Gold Rush is the first and only level on the main set of levels to have this old western theme. But it's a really fun vibe to see, crash running and spinning through all the same. The soundtrack is also really catchy here. On top of that, this level also is the longest in the game, with several unique enemy types and obstacles that only show up in this one level. Something about seeing Crash Bandicoot jump and spin his way through an old western town really gives me Looney Tunes vibes. I'm almost half expecting Yosemite Sam to come around the corner and try to shoot Crash Bandicoot. There is also a minecart section that, while a little bit random and definitely slows down the pace of the level, it doesn't go on for too too long and isn't annoying to control at the very least. As a matter of fact, the only real thing pulling this level down from being as good as I believe it could be are all the climbing sections in the level which majorly bring down the pace even further and are just annoying to get through. But besides that annoyance, the general level design of this level is good. So so far, this fifth warp room has been pretty damn good. 
and it has unique settings for each one at that. So let's see how these two are followed up. Medieval Madness. Ah, uh, another Atlasphere level. This time medieval flavored with yet another amazing soundtrack. This level unfortunately still sees Crash's former enemies being used as total dummies in several places across the level. But besides that obvious eyesore and insultment, this level isn't too bad actually. I do think it's my least favorite of the Atlasphere levels thus far though and probably my least favorite of the Atlas Spheres overall, if we're not including the boss battle, which would definitely be the worst. It's still pretty interesting and not a bad level, but I do wish more of these levels reached the highs of the first Atlas Sphere level. I feel like the emphasis on going through tubes and up and down slopes and the like is really the type of design where these levels do their best. And there's not really much of that here. Crate Balls of Fire. Crate Balls of Fire opens on a forward camera grate section, so uh, uh, not off to a strong start. This level besides that section though is just okay. It does feature a part where you're running away from this big explosion of sorts in a mech suit. And in general, three quarters of the level is played within that mech suit. And while the chase section is kind of fun, the rest of the level is pretty forgettable to me. Cortex Vortex. Finally, we reach the last level of the game. Cortex Vortex, and it's actually pretty good. Aesthetically, this is a really magnificent level, with the use of the dark blue and spiraling lights serving as a good contrast against the orange Crash Bandicoot. The music is climactic and clearly building towards your final confrontation with Cortex. and generally speaking is a pretty tightly designed level. It also has this great section where you get three Aku Aku masks and then tear through a bunch of dumb grenade lobbers and nitro crates, which is very satisfying, though it would have been even more satisfying if the Aku Aku mask lasted as long as it did in the OG trilogy, 20 seconds instead of the 10 that it is in this game, or if it had that iconic music. Kind of a weird time to bring up this whole Aku Aku mask different stuff, what this being the final level and all, but I figured it's worth mentioning since that has bothered me ever since I was a kid playing this game. Back on point, the final level is pretty damn good, though difficulty wise it is kind of a joke compared to the likes of Crash 2 or 1, which I suppose is fine, but in general I think Crash the Wrath of Cortex is one of the easiest Crash games to finish and complete as well, which, while not objectively a bad thing by any means, is still very disappointing as the original trilogy, while some entries are more difficult than others, I believe always struck the right balance in finding new ways to challenge the player while still being perfectly fair, while Crash the Wrath of Cortex seems a little too easy for my liking. It's only difficulty usually coming from sluggish or awkward vehicle controls or, in some cases, bad game design. It does have the occasional bit of tricky platforming, but overall, the game is just far too easy most of the time, and it feels rather hollow for it. I do think the difficulty being brought down a peg is definitely an intentional game design choice rather than an oversight, though. More than likely to make the game as accessible and easy for new players on new consoles and the like to be able to enjoy, which is fine, but still, all the same, quite disappointing. But with all that being said, let's discuss the final boss. Congratulations, Crash. You should be proud of yourself. Not only have you collected all the crystals in record time, but you also defeated the elementals. Let Crunch and me be the first ones to congratulate you. 
by pummeling your sad bandicoot frame into a pulp. Come and get it. Cortex. So for the grand finale of this game, we have a rather interesting boss battle. In theory. To start, I love how the start of the fight sees Crash and Crunch facing off against one another, and then you have that banging soundtrack. As for the mechanics, basically there are four buttons that Crunch will jump on to activate a mask that will come down and attack you. Rocco will shoot these asteroids down on you, Wawa will launch these ice blocks into the arena, Pyro will turn certain parts of the floor hot, and Lolo activates these laser beams. However, Crunch will only start the battle using only one of these, Rocco's attack, until you get a hit point off of Cortex. You do that by waiting for Crunch to get tuckered out from jumping, I guess. Man, I thought he was supposed to be the stronger Crash Bandicoot. You telling me this beefed up Bandicoot can't jump around for more than a few seconds without getting tired? Well, anyway, when he does get tired, you shoot at him with your Wumpa Bazooka. This'll get him to hit Cortex for some reason, and then you hit Cortex once he's on the ground. Rinse and repeat with each hit point adding a new elemental attack, constantly raising the stakes and difficulty of the battle until you've hit Cortex four times. Now, I've heard some people complain about the needing of the use of the Wumpa Bazooka to hit Crunch in this battle. And while yes, no other boss in the game has required you to do that, I think it's pretty cool that this boss makes use of every single move at your disposal to beat it. A true test of everything that you've learned. Again, in theory. You see, there is a terrible truth about this boss fight. One that all the reviews and retrospectives on this boss that I've seen, even the ones that are hyper detailed about all the flaws of this game, has never even once brought up ever. This boss can be cheesed extremely easily, and it really doesn't take any skill to do so. See how there's this little lip that is in between the lasers? Well, if you stand here, you're perfectly safe from the ice attack, the fire attack, as well as the laser attack, with Rocco's move being the only thing that you still have to move around to avoid, meaning that if you stand here, three of the four attacks are completely avoidable without moving a muscle. This makes what is actually a very cool boss fight a complete joke. And what's crazy is I learned about this trick when I was only nine years old. Now given, if you play the Xbox version of the game, it seems that someone there noticed this major oversight and made it so that you can't just jump on the hangover here to be in the safety zone the majority of the battle. So kudos to whoever did that because when played straight, this boss fight is actually very fun. It's a decent challenge and is without a doubt the best boss in the game. It's just such a shame that in most versions of this game, it can be so easily made a joke of. Though I guess since I'm one of the only people online to have noticed this, maybe this doesn't actually play too much of a factor, but you all know now and so I have forever ruined this boss for you outside of the Xbox version. You're uh, welcome, I guess. After you defeat Cortex, you get this cutscene that plays out like this. Can't you ever let me win? What do you want from me, you cretin? Cortex! You realize that Crash may have collected all the crystals, but he doesn't have the gems. With the gems, we can resurrect the masks one last time and destroy that bandicoot once and for all. Which then leads into this sudden, random credit scene of Crash and this other guy disco dancing. Very interesting way to close out the game, I must say. No, if you don't get all the gems in this game along with all the relics, then you won't be able to get a satisfying conclusion to the game, story-wise. So with that in mind, let's finally talk about the relics and the time trials. So just like Crash Warped, every level in this game has a time attack mode you try to get through it as fast as possible. And for every five relics you obtain, you unlock another level in the secret six set of levels. Now, generally speaking, the relics in this game are far more easy to obtain than the ones in Crash Warp. Though, as I've mentioned before, the lethargic and floaty controls mixed with levels that have minute-long sections of climbing on slow grates like Droid Void and the like, really slows things down to a crawl. As I stated before, Crash Warp was designed with speed in mind and going for those gold or platinum relic times in that game 
with all your power-ups really recontextualizes all the levels and helps in really appreciating how Naya Dog not only made these stages fun on a first playthrough, but a whole new kind of fun on a second time trial run. However, this finer point in Crash Warp's game design is something that I don't often see brought up, nor does it seem to be an element that was focused on whatsoever in this game. There are some levels that feel okay to speedrun through, mind you, and I still had some fun trying to get through some of the levels and get the best times, but without those snappy controls of Crash Warped, it just never feels as good to me. Oh, also weird fact. So, whenever I was first going through all the time trials, because I was first doing it on the GameCube version, I thought the Sapphire Relic Time was the Platinum Relic Time at first, because the Sapphire and Platinum Relic models look so fucking similar, especially when they are super small like this, which is... I, I don't know what they were thinking with that. Why didn't you make the Sapphire one just bluer to make it extra clear? I've also heard that in the PS2 version, which again came first, has different time relic times than that of the GameCube and Xbox versions, with most people saying that the PS2 one originally had relic times that were way, way easier to platinum and that this was one of the things that they fixed to be more challenging in the GameCube and Xbox versions. It says this on nearly every Crash-related wiki that I could find, but not a single one of them ever actually tell you what the relic time differences are between the different console versions. I looked high and low and could not seem to find anything about the actual numbers for this, which is weird since so much beta and console differences are usually well documented with this game. I was even desperate enough to try looking through uh, Let's Plays, I tried looking at old walkthroughs to see if the timings were different or anything, and unless I'm missing something, it seems like all the times are exactly the same as the GameCube and Xbox versions. I would play through this game again on the PS2 just to see if the times are in fact different or if this is a myth, but uh, this video is already long enough as is, so maybe one of you kind commenters can go do that for me and let me know if this is really the case. Anyway, let's talk about the last five levels in this game that you can unlock via collecting at least the bitch blue relics. Nighttime. For the first of these extra stages, we have yet another Cortex Castle type level, but this time featuring Coco, and this one's pretty decent, with one of the best tracks in the game no less. Not a bad start overall, Ghost Town. And just like that, we have arrived at the worst level in the game. This is not even a matter of opinion. This is probably one of the worst levels in Crash Bandicoot history. Not because it has terrible or sluggish mechanics, not because it's hard for unfair reasons, or because it's slow. No. This is the worst level in the game because it can be beaten by doing literally nothing. Yep, you see this right. In this level, where you race Crunch Bandicoot in these minecarts around this Old West looking track, you don't have to press a single thing to win the race. The fact that no one caught this, that no one tested this to see if this is possible, it's, well, it's rather silly to say the least. For this reason, this level is an unfinished showcase of rushed game design that sadly enough is supposed to be one of the rewards for collecting relics. Shameful. Now given, if you play through this level collecting all the boxes or going after the relic and actually play the level, well, it's still a shit level. It's far too basic and easy to finish no matter what goal you're actually after in it. Though I will say, oddly enough, in the Xbox version, it seems that they actually might have fixed this issue of being able to beat it without doing anything, as when I first tried to do just that, it didn't work. I was actually kind of surprised. I thought, wow, could it be that they made this level mandatory to touch the controller to finish? Well, then I tried it again just to make sure it wasn't a fluke, and 
Sure enough, it was a fluke, because the second time I played through the level, I didn't press anything, and I won. So now I guess, instead of it being a 100% chance that you will win the level no matter what by pressing nothing, now, in the Xbox version, they made it a 50-50 chance. So that's some progress, I suppose. But hey, I guess that's why the level is called Ghost Town, because even a dead person could finish it. So remember this point, ladies and gentlemen. The good news is, is it's gonna take us a while to get to a lower point in this franchise in this retrospective than this level. The bad news is, is we will eventually get there. Ice Station Bandicoot. This level sees the return of the helipack from the opening of Volcano Lab, and you race a... a polar bear on a magic carpet. Sure. I mean, I guess it's an okay level if you like mindlessly flying through rings and racing some dumb, random polar bear. Again, this one just feels half-baked and pretty underwhelming overall. But if you're a big fan of Superman 64, then, <laughs> you know, this level's got you covered. Solar Bowler. This is the last of the atmosphere levels, and I actually think this level is alright. It's a decent up and challenge, the atmosphere is unique, the topsy-turvy platforms really test your skills at maneuvering the atmosphere, and yeah, overall a pretty fun level. Force of Nature. And for the final extra level, we have this very underwhelming Coco level, where she's on a snowboard. It is kind of notable in that I find the controls here with it when trying to use it to platform up and get the mid-air boxes to be, well, really awkward at best, and absolutely infuriatingly annoying to control at worst. So this level serves as one last little bit of irritation before the game is over. Other than that though, there's nothing much special about it. So overall, the majority of the extra levels are pretty lackluster, with three of the five of them being underwhelming or just straight awful or even the worst level in the game, which is pretty disappointing. Still, with nearly everything wrapped up, I suppose we ought to talk about the ending of this game. So, the ending cutscene shows Cortex whining about how Crash has beaten him again, before Uka Uka decides it's time to finally kill Cortex, I, I guess, and shoots this really tiny little pathetic projectile at him that he easily dodges, and was shot from the side for some reason even though Uka Uka was in front of him. Uh, wh whatever, whatever. Can't you ever let me win? What do you want from me, you creep? No, Uka Uka, I can explain. It's too late for that now! Uh, I don't think you should have done that. Uka Uka accidentally hits something vital in the space station, and then Crunch wakes up from being beaten and is no longer under the brainwashed control of Dr. Cortex, and now he's awake and ready to kill Cortex. But Aku Aku advises against that. Oh, no. Where am I? Hey, wait a second. That annoying scientist doesn't have control over me anymore. Where is that pathetic twerp? There's no time for that now, Crunch. Danger. Critical power overload in Evil Space Station. Run for your lives. So Crash and Co. escape the space station, and Cortex in his dead-eyed stare and completely expressionless eyebrows now tells Uka Uka that they should do the same. I think your energy boat caused a slight chain reaction. It might be wise if we made our way to the escape pods. This is all your fault! If you hadn't ducked out of the way, none of this would have happened! This doesn't look good. We then skip ahead to Crash and Coco and Aku Aku welcoming Crunch into their home. They broke the doctor's power over him and gave him back his free will, something he's very thankful for. And Crunch says this one line about believing in him. Crash, Coco, Aku Aku, I'm grateful to all of you. If it weren't for you, I'd still be under the control of Dr. Cortex. Thank you for believing in me, guys. I think is very sweet, but it does make me kind of wish that there was an element of that in the ending after you get everything where there was maybe one more round to the fight or something and that you had to choose to spare Crunch, 
Or there could have been a cutscene where we see Crash has the means of getting rid of Crunch for good, but chooses to save him instead. That would make this line make even more sense and be even more sweet. I think something like that would have put a nice bow on this, even if it all comes together at the very end of the game. Since Crunch and that dynamic between him and Crash, narratively, I believe is the game's strongest point. And I think showcasing Crash taking mercy on Crunch, even if that is technically what happened, actually showcasing it more than just Crunch saying it here, I feel like would have been an extra strong character moment for all characters involved. Crunch would later go on to be a reoccurring character in the series, and I actually really like Crunch. There isn't much to him here, mind you, but since Crash and Coco sort of have this bit of a Sonic and Tails type dynamic, Crunch being the knuckles of the group, I think really adds to it. Plus, I just think it's a sweet idea that Crash and Co. help out these mutants that are abused and used by Cortex and welcome them into their home. But anyway, Coco asks Aku Aku if he thinks that this is the last time they'll see Cortex and Uka Uka and he believes that it won't be, which then cuts over to a scene of Cortex and Uka Uka stranded out in the middle of nowhere in the Antarctic wastes. Uka Uka torching Cortex's ass as he swears revenge on Crash Bandicoot, ending out the game. Idiot! Fool! Man come poop! You've landed us in the middle of nowhere! Ouch! Whoa! No, wait! I can explain! Ah! I'll get my revenge, Crash Bandicoot! Just you wait! So, in closing, Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex is a flawed game. More than that, it's a downgrade in nearly all fronts from the PS1 trilogy that it was looking to be a successor to. There are many reasons for this. The first is that the game was rushed going from an ambitious new type of Crash Bandicoot game to a game that tries its best to imitate Crash Warped. The second being that in the pursuit of that goal, the game either fails to meet the highs of Crash Warped or in some cases take the wrong lessons from what made that game so good to begin with. There were many vehicle levels in Crash Warped, so the Wrath of Cortex adds even more, with several that only show up once. Crash Warped had time trials, so we gotta include those, but nearly none of the levels are built around speedrunning them, some levels even being a slog on a casual run, let alone a speedrun through them. Crash Warped had cutscenes where you see the boss characters talk to Crash, so this game should have it too. But there are no fun interactions or unique personalities, it's just element-based puns. Crash Warped had you gain new moves after every boss, so we should have that too in this game. But no one could come up with a new one, except for the Sneaky Shoes, which has literally nothing to the core gameplay of Crash. Are you seeing a bit of a pattern here? The truth of it is, is Crash the Wrath of Cortex isn't even a terrible game. It does have some nice qualities, and is a casually fun experience from time to time. And if I looked on it on its own, in its own small little bubble, I think the game is alright, but pretty mid overall. But when compared to what came before it, it suddenly looks a lot worse. Especially since this was also the first Crash game to come out on next-gen consoles. The first Crash game to go multi-platform. The first real Crash game to be developed by a new studio. This game had a lot to prove, and on nearly every mark possible, the game comes up short. And hell, it doesn't just come up short when compared to the PS1 originals, it also comes short as far as the 3D platformer space of 2001, when this game was first released next to names like Jack and Daxter, a new franchise made by the original Crash devs, with no loading screens, an amazing moveset that's extremely fun to play with, and a new world full of lore and characters to discover and explore on the brand new PlayStation 2, or Sonic Adventure 2 on the Dreamcast and later on the GameCube with its more serious story, super tight controls, and masterfully crafted levels and design the swan song of the Dreamcast. Not to mention the countless other games that would come to define the 3D platformer space within the next year, 
like those of Ratchet and Clank or Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus. When you look at the whole big picture like that, the more this game not only doing nothing new besides more vehicle stages and some more special graphical effects, I suppose, but also failing to even match the quality of what came before, let alone matching the quality of its current peers, it all starts to look a lot more grim for this game and franchise moving forward. Luckily though, the game did sell really well. It was Crash Bandicoot after all, people still love this franchise. So even if this game was below average, it still facilitated the cash to make the future of this franchise still a bright one. But as far as direction goes, this is where the series would go through a major struggle. So many people seem to be under the impression that people didn't like Crash the Wrath of Cortex because it doesn't do anything new. That is just more of Crash Warped. And I hope that I've showcased here in this part of the retrospective that Crash the Wrath of Cortex is in fact not more of Crash Warped. And it does nothing new. These things not being mutually exclusive, you see. It is a poor imitation of Crash Warped, inferior on nearly every level, on top of also having nothing new but more vehicle stages. If this game had been as good as Crash Warped, and how maybe even improved just even a little bit here and there, I think this game would have been remembered far more kindly than what it was and how it is now. Mind you, it was never considered a terrible game, but just mid, a downgrade. About a 6.5 out of 10. Growing up with all these games, I remember I used to like this game just as much as the others in the series. But as I've gotten older and come to appreciate what makes the original trilogy so good, as well as what makes each game in the original trilogy so good, the more this game has looked worse and worse, that it doesn't feel like a whole finished product. Still, as I said, this game was rushed, and you can tell. So while I do believe there are some clear issues with the developer's vision of the game fundamentally, even outside of it being rushed, who knows how good it could have been had they been given more time. But you can't judge something by what it could have been but by what it is. A lesson that must be remembered as we move forward through this retrospective, as this is a theme that would come to haunt this franchise as we move forward into the next mainline entry of Crash Bandicoot. And that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching this super duper long video about Crash the Wrath of Cortex. I know there was like a five to six month like stop between the last Crash video to this one, uh, but going forward I'm gonna try to have these coming out more consistently alongside the other types of videos. With all that being said, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of my loyal patrons and channel members for their contributions and donations towards this channel and myself including all of my Night Eggs and Night Owlets, as well as all of my great Night Owls, including Star Punch Gaming, Hex Maniac Hanna, Cruz and Obscura, Tony Teramaya, Justice, Bacab Kaiju, Hohot, and Medusa's Hex. As well as a very super special thank you to all of my Arch Owls, including the Good Chi Vibes and Garden Party, the Wise Daniel and Very Talented Doggy NGT, the Gun Toten Thursday, the Fearless Forgotten Ace, and the Super Saiyan Sword. Thank you all for watching this video, and until next time, this has been Dylan the Night Owl, flying off.